Hello my fellow comic book collectors, it's Alan, the Comic Collector Geek, and this is my Q&A video where I basically answer your questions. Each week uh, people ask me questions on the Wednesday videos and I answer them. Uh, this week I actually got a bunch of questions, uh, some really great ones, uh, and let's get right into it. Uh, first question comes from Kay Munin. What are what are your favorite classic and modern anime series? Well, okay, so I actually really enjoy anime. Um, the first major anime that I watched was Akira, um, but I but I actually watched ones before because I didn't realize that they were anime because I was really young at the time. I watched Star Blazers as a kid a lot, and um, after I learned about Akira and watched that, I then met some people that were also into anime, and I watched Bubblegum Crisis, AD Police, um, another series that I watched, which is kind of silly, but <laughs> it's one that I watched, was Sailor Moon. I enjoyed Sailor Moon. I thought it was kind of funny. Um, nowadays, the modern stuff that I watch for anime would be like Death Note, Fairy Tail, Naruto, Black Clover, uh, and currently I'm watching the series uh, My Happy Marriage, which is a really great series, actually. So <laughs> those are so some of the many that I've watched. I've watched dozens of uh, anime. So hopefully that answers your question. Uh, Comic Meg Musings wrote, Okay, here's a question for you, Canadian can do can noodler. Um, can you collect, do you collect any Skywalt, Skywalt magazines? So for those who are not familiar with Skywalt, it was a magazine, kind of a competitor to Warren Publishing uh, from 1970 to 1975. It had two founders, uh, Sol Brodsky and um, Israel uh, Waldman. So you got Brodsky <laughs> and Waldman and basically they took those two pieces and put them together to make Sky Walt. So uh, they mainly were known for uh, publishing more horror related magazines, but they actually published weird things like uh, a one shot about Ju Julie Garden. And uh, they, you know, so they produced other things other than horror, but they produced mainly horror, uh, westerns, uh, some superheroes as well. Uh, and um, the main three titles that they'd be kind of known for would be Nightmare, which was actually their first title. Uh, so Nightmare number one is actually their first magazine that they published. Uh, and then Psycho and then Scream. Uh, the other cool thing about Nightmare is it actually features the very first published work by uh, John Byrne. <laughs> so uh, if you find Nightmare number 20, and it's from August of 1974. And that's the first John Byrne. Uh, so some pretty cool things with uh, Skywald. And actually, I don't necessarily collect Skywald, but I do have some Skywald in my collection because there's some pretty cool titles within Skywald. Um, so one of the ones that I mentioned is Psycho. This is Psycho number one. It's got a really great cover. Uh, so yeah, this is from January of 1971. It's a great cover. And Psycho number... I'm not sure what number this is. Uh, this is from March of 1971, so maybe Psycho number three, <laughs> I think. Uh, this features the first uh, appearance of The Heap. Now, The Heap actually appeared in the Golden Age, but he made a reappearance in the Bronze Age, and this is that first reappearance, I guess, uh, the Heap. It's kind of a cool Swamp Thing-like character. Uh, and they also had like a series called Hellrider, and it only lasted two issues. So this is Hellrider Rider number one, and uh, this was actually kind of like a prototype for um, Hell uh, <laughs> uh, um, Ghost Rider. You know, it's very similar kind of things going on. Um, he's not supernatural like uh, Ghost Rider, but, you know, it's still a cool character. Um, and it also features the very first appearance of the butterfly. 
Now, the butterfly is the first female uh, superhero, the bl black female superhero in comics. So her first appearance was in this one as well. So this is double key. Uh, very cool comic. Um, and I just happen to have both issues, so I have issue number two as well. <laughs> so so Hellraider Rider number one and number two. And that's pretty much my collection of Skywalk. <laughs> I, I might have a few other titles in some of my magazine boxes, but those are the main ones that I have handy. Um, so that's my Skywalk collection. I, I actually probably will buy that Nightmare number 20 and probably get a Nightmare number one because I kind of like those key books. Um, but I don't have them yet. So, yeah. I'm not a big Skywald collector, but I might become one. Who knows? Um, I also would like to probably get Scream one number one, uh, a number one of that as well. Okay. Uh, Fiddle Chips wrote, Do you know the print run of Golden Age comics? He has a theory that uh, the Golden Age and the 90s era um had similar print runs and he would be right about that so actually it's very hard to find out what the print runs of golden age comics are um now the, for example action one people know what the print run of that is it's around two hundred thousand. and the part of the reason why it had that level of print run was actually that was considered a low number <laughs> they were just really testing it out um you know that that's the difference with uh the golden age compared to modern age sometimes they have lower early numbers and then as the the comics you know get popular then they start ramping the numbers up so for example Cla captain marvel adventures if you look at the early issues of captain marvel adventures very low print runs um and i don't know what the actual numbers are but as the series became more popular um they went up to like 1.4 million per issue <laughs> so just massive print runs that's why even to this day um even with all the things that happened to the golden age comics a lot of those uh golden age captain marvels um are still pretty readily available they're pretty easy to find so 1.4 million per issue that's a pretty big print run uh, Superman uh, number one, for example, had a print run of about a million copies because it, by that point, uh, Action Comics was fairly successful and the Superman character was well established and they went big with his first solo book. Uh, another series that is kind of a major one is Famous Funnies, which had a print run of around 300 to 400,000. Now, during the 90s, Whenever there was a big release of a comic, so similar to a Superman 1, well, we would have like X-Men 1 or um, Spawn 1 <laughs> or, or those like those big books. So uh, and Spider-Man 1 is another one that came out in the 90s uh, that had massive print runs. So X-Men number one had the biggest print run of any comic ever and it had 8 million print runs. Uh, Spider-Man 1 had a print run of about a million. So just huge print runs <laughs> for those books. Um, now that's very comparable to the Golden Age. Uh, actually the print runs in general were fairly high during the 90s uh, for pretty much any comic. Um, much higher than they are today. So a typical print run maybe in the 90s would be like 200 to 400,000. Whereas nowadays, uh, the typical print runs anywhere from fifty to a hundred thousand, so much much lower print runs. Um, the actual lowest time period for the comic community or comic industry was during the early two thousands. So after the nineties kind of boom bust um, cycle, um, there was a real move away from comics, and the early two thousands had a really low print runs. Um, anywhere from 10,000 to 20 to 50,000 range. So really much lower than what we see today even. So um, those are kind of the, <laughs> the cycles of the print runs. Actually, what's really interesting is um, during the Silver Age, there was actually fairly high print runs of most of the comics as well. Um, in the Bronze Age, it was actually less than the Silver Age. And then the Copper Age kind of went up again um, compared to... Uh, 
the earlier eras. So just interesting things. You can find a lot of this census data on comiccron.com, uh, but the only problem is they only go from the 1960s up till now. <laughs> so they don't have pre 1960s. So it's really hard to get that golden age information. Um, there's a few things that people don't realize about the golden age in terms of the print runs. As I said, their numbers are very high, but um, the numbers of returns is also high. So you'd have like um, comics going out on the shelves, they would get returned where they would rip off the top of the comic and then uh, they would get the, the, the store would get compensated for the fact that they didn't actually sell those comics. Um, that, that does add a bit more to the scarcity of those um, golden age comics compared to the 90s where often what was happening was um, the, the stores would have to keep those copies. They couldn't just return them. They couldn't do the remainder thing anymore. Uh, and what happened is you have comic stores actually developing large back issue sections to their stores. And it was a very different model from the golden age. So even though the, the print runs are comparable, uh, often what happens is within the modern era or within the 90s, uh, a lot of those books, you know, didn't get returned. So, so you'd still have these high number of comics staying within the, within the market. So just something else to, to think about. Okay, next question comes from John Knapp. Do you think white pages command a higher price than lower page quality? Yes. Um, and I want to explain a little bit about page quality. Uh, when people think of page quality, they usually think of OWL, which is Overstreet's whiteness level. And basically, it's a scale from brittle pages to slightly brittle pages to <laughs> uh, tan pages to um, off-white pages than white pages. So, And then there's like mixtures of those where it's brittle, uh, or slightly brittle, then uh, tan, uh, maybe tan to uh, off-white, <laughs> and then, you know, and then off-white to, you know, white pages, uh, kind of like there's a little in-between of those. So there, it's a pretty broad scale. Um, and basically it's just a color chart where you, you have this little chart, it's the owl color chart, and you compare it to the page, and you can see what uh, what quality of those pages are. I'll give you an example of Brittle. Um, this is one of my comics that has Brittle pages. And it could be the case that, um, for example, most of this, probably not Brittle, but just this one section has Brittle. Um, and what happens is over time, uh, comics will disintegrate. <laughs> they, um, they will oxidize and uh, the paper will, um, I, I think there's something within the paper that gradually breaks down over time. And um, there's things that you can do like preserving it in a case, air, you know, reduce the amount of ex exposure to air uh, and light. Those things really do impact um, comics and also maintaining it in a, proper humid environment, not too humid, not too dry, <laughs> like sort of in between. Uh, and then um, what they will also do within CGC cases is they'll put in a special paper that uh, removes any acidi uh, acidity in the paper from the paper so that it will uh, protect the paper from disintegrating. But part of the reason people don't like brittle pages is that means it's closer to being dust. <laughs> So a lot of the time um, people look at brittle pages and are very wary of them because it means that the comic is literally disintegrating. Uh, white pages, on the other hand, um, and I'll give you an example. This is a modern comic uh, that has white pages and it's just denoted at the top or you can see it right there. It says white pages. The other one said brittle pages. Sometimes on the older slabs, it'll denote it here. On the more new slabs, they will denote it in the where the grading is. So you see the grade brittle pages. So with with white pages, yes, it does command more money. Most modern comics will get the white page denotation. Uh, however, 
Uh, there are cases where you can get off-white pages, uh, you know, white to off-white pages in the modern era. Um, but basically what it does, it, it, it gives you a sense of how good is the book. So it could be a 9-8, but white to off-white pages. Well, a white pager <laughs> would be just a that much better version of that 9-8. So often you'll see um, a premium for the higher page quality. Um, and as I was saying, with brutal pages, obviously there's a negative, the opposite effect, where um, people will generally pay less for a, a, a comic of equal grade if it says brittle pages compared to something that says off-white or tan. Um, so page quality is being factored in. Um, as you get more with the modern comics, more than the older comics, like older comics, yeah, it can play a role, but often there's just not the volume of sales compared to the modern era to really say, oh, this one, you know, it's white pages, therefore I have to, you know, uh, pay extra for it. Um, Whereas anything from bronze or even silver up has enough of a, a census count where you can say, okay, this is a white pager versus an off-white page. Uh, therefore, maybe it's worth maybe 10% more or whatever amount more because people will want that just that one notch better. <laughs> you know, something that distinguishes themselves between the somebody that has some other copy. You know, people, there are, you know, collectors that really want the highest quality book as possible. Um, to give you a sense of how far that can go, that extreme of wanting the best comic ever, um, people will chase after a 10 which is that perfect comic, or a 9-9 or whatever. But they'll also look at things called centering. And um, a good example of that is actually uh, Suspense 39. Uh, Tales of Suspense 39, which is the first appearance of Iron Man. Now, the centering of that book uh, can actually have like, there's like a little quote around, uh, around on the front. And it when some of the books were created, they would chop off the, just the way that they would cut them in the press. Um, they would chop off one of the quotes on the, that was close to the edge. And um, so, books that have the both quotes a little better centering can actually command a premium so collectors will look for these little little details to get slightly a better copy than somebody else um so often you know these are things to be aware of uh and if you can get a white pager <laughs> get a white pager you know it, it'll generally be a better investment than a lower page quality book uh, in the golden age, you know, uh, probably that off-white is considered like a higher page quality. Though I do, in my personal collection, I do have some um, white page golden age books. Like the Cindy that's right behind me, um, if you can see it right there. Oh, wait. Right there. <laughs> I'm not really good at pointing. Uh, the Cindy. Uh, that's a white pager. It's a 2.0, but it's a white pager. Whether it makes much difference at that grade um is debatable but it is a white pager so it is a little bit better than a 2.0 that isn't a white pager um also people look for other factors uh not just page quality and not just centering uh, centering is more for modern things because people are a little bit more <laughs> you know they have more of the variety to pick from um but they actually look for um there's like a good example is a 0.5 or a 1.0 or uh, some of the really low grades where what they'll look for is how do the defects that bring it down to that grade impact the the look of the comic. So for example, I have 1.0s that have beautiful covers. I mean, really, really nice covers. Um, you would actually think that it was a much higher grade because it's in a slab. You can't see the defect. And the defect for those books is generally the spine split. <laughs> you know, the spine can be completely split and it gets a 1-0, um, but it looks beautiful. And there were certain comics that had that issue of spine splitting, where they would just naturally split. Um, and um, 
you can you can find really great examples where they're the beautiful cover and it's a spine split gets a really low grade but that compared to something where uh, there's a 1.0 and it's missing a big chunk because in a 1.0 you can pretty much miss a fair amount of the book and still get that 1.0 grade um, which would you rather have something that shows really really well or stunning uh, compared to something that's missing big chunks out of the cover obviously you're going to pick the better looking one so there's a whole bunch of factors these are kind of the uh the grade isn't necessarily the 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 thing that people should be focusing on sometimes um so what you had to look at is buy the book and not the grade that's kind of one of these things that's being coined more and more or used more and more within the comic book collecting community uh, because of the fact that um, there are so many minor factors that actually can have a big impact on the value of the book. So just something to consider. <laughs> I, I want to add more to the, the question than you asked, but I figured, hey, it was useful information. Okay, last question comes from my good friend, uh, Stephen Gettner. And under his St Stepofy <laughs> account, and he wrote... What was the origin of Wonder Woman in the 1940s? What was her name? Where and how did she get her powers? And did Wonder Woman's origin change at all over, over the years? Her powers, and if so, and how if at all? Okay, so her name that we know in the comics is usually denoted as Diana Prince, but that's not her real name. <laughs> her real name is Princess Diana of the Mascara. Now, uh, the reason she's called Diana Prince, and that's kind of her alias name, kind of like Clark Kent is Superman's alias, um, what happened was uh, when she rescued Steve Trevor, her boyfriend and the guy that kind of brought her into our world um there was a nurse that was attending to him and her name was prince <laughs> like something prince and so she took her name i think they both had the same name i think uh the nurse's first name and her first name were the same so it was diana prince the nurse and then princess diana um and so what happened was uh, she took the nurse's name and then took the person, the nurse's identity and the nurse went off to marry her boyfriend. <laughs> like that, that's how the story was. So, uh, so basically she took that nurse's identity. And um, so that's how she got her name. That's her origin of her name. In terms of the origin of the character herself, like as a person, uh, there are two origin stories. The first is really what was from the golden age all the way up to the modern age of comics was that um, she was sculpted out of clay by her mother, a hippo, uh, I can never pronounce her name, Hippolyta, Hippolyta. Um, and um, basically, uh, so she was sculpted out of clay, given life, okay? And she <laughs> became like, you know, uh, Amazon warrior. The later in 2011, they rewrote her origin story to make her a daughter of both Zeus, uh, the god Zeus, the, the father of all the gods, and Queen Hippolyta. <laughs> okay, so um, that's that was the modern era. So her origin stories in terms of uh there's actually been multiple retellings of wonder woman's stories uh in terms of why she came to uh here <laughs> uh, but they involve steve trevor landing on um the mascara now what happened was in the original one he landed in the mascara and they actually were kind of like taking care of him in the mascara which is the the paradise island where all the amazons live uh in the silver age they changed it slightly uh that if a man should step on the mascara uh they will lose all their powers 
so uh, so they changed it a little bit and um, so she had to actually rescue him and then just quickly go off and uh, take him to uh, somewhere away from them uh, she took him to a ship and basically uh, <laughs> saved him that way uh, but then they did in in the origins of her kind of becoming Wonder Woman is they she had to go through a trial and basically prove herself to be the champion of the Amazon women. So that was kind of Wonder Woman's origin of her becoming the character that we know. Um, in terms of her powers, uh, some of her powers come from her natural godlike background. Uh, she's kind of like a demigod. Uh, she's immortal. Uh, she has super strength, super agility, super speed, super um, strength. Uh, she can also fly. In the original Golden Age, though, she couldn't necessarily fly, but she could ride um, the different air currents, and she knew how to like fly that way. Uh, she could find updrafts and stuff like that. It's kind of weird, but um, she she gained the ability to fly basically over the years. Uh, but a lot of her extra powers came from gifts that she was given. And what I mean by that is uh, she was given uh, a, an invincible jet, which she uses to fly around. And she was given um, a, a, lasso of, a lasso of truth, uh, which is very like a, a, in, in, like a very cool item because basically she's always in bondage. <laughs> and, uh, um, that's her weakness, actually. Um, and basically uh, she's carrying her own bondage kit with her but uh, the lasso uh, basically uh, allows her to do a couple things one it allows her to capture people so she, she can use it to capture people but also when in the in, captured by the lasso you basically have to tell the truth and this be is because uh, the original creator of Wonder Woman Marston uh, he was the inventor of the lie detector, so he added that element to her. Another great feature of Wonder Woman, another gift that she has, is her bracelets. Uh, her bracelets are indestructible, and she uses them to deflect bullets. Um, another thing that she has is her tiara that she wears. Um, that she actually can remove. And she can throw it at people. It's like a projectile <laughs> that she uses. She also has a sword and shield that she sometimes uses. Um, but those are her major ones. Uh, and what else? Um, so those are the, the major things about Wonder Woman. Now there was one point in the 60s uh, where she lost all of her powers. And even her like cool little extra toys... Uh, and she ended up learning um, martial arts, <laughs> and uh, uh, that was her her thing. So that was the other thing with Wonder Woman. She she is not just um, you know, in some ways she's better than Superman. And I'll explain this. Uh, Superman has all these same powers that Wonder Woman has, but the one difference between Wonder Woman and Superman is Wonder Woman has the Amazonian training. They, they actually train really hard and learn the different skills like archery and horseback riding and the different skills of a warrior. And so she has warrior training. Whereas Superman never had that. He's just super strong and he beats up anybody that goes around him because he's just that powerful. Uh, Wonder Woman at least is that powerful plus has these um, extra training. Uh, so yeah, some little bonus about Wonder Woman. Uh, but as I said, she did lose her powers for a brief time in the 60s, but then regained them back because they realized that she's lame without them. <laughs> so, uh, But uh, yeah, so that was um, Wonder Woman. Uh, I hope you enjoyed my answers. I think I got all the parts of it. Um, but yeah, I, I'm a big fan of Wonder Woman. She's like my second favorite character. Uh, Vampirella is actually my favorite. Um, but yeah, if you have any questions uh, about any anything, <laughs> pretty much comic related, I will give you a pretty reasonable answer, I hope. And um, just put it in the comments below and I'll answer it. Um, one last thing I have to tell people, and I might do a, a live show about this, is I have been nominated 
for uh, a special award. Uh, it, a CBCA Awards are going on right now. And uh, basically, uh, you can vote for your favorite channel. Uh, and there's a bunch of categories. Uh, my channel has been nominated and it's on the short list for best uh, unboxing. And if you watch my channel, you'll notice I do lots of unboxings. <laughs> so I, I would like to put out a request. Uh, you know, I'm answering your questions. Here's a favor that I ask in return. Uh, if you could just vote for this channel for best unboxing, I will send the link. I'll put the link in the description. Just follow the link, click my channel, and <laughs> give me a, um, a vote. That would be really appreciated. And, and when you're there, vote for some other channels that you like. So um, just not in my category. Just vote for me in my category. Everyone else, I don't care. <laughs> just vote for, vote, vote for the channels you like. Um, and if you, don't vote, if you don't like my channel, don't vote. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I'm just being silly. Um, so again, thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. Bye for now.